I'll give you back your view graph, because I'm going to talk about a few more numbers. And they're all here, so you don't have to copy anything. They'll all be on the web. The world energy consumption of the entire world of 6 billion people. By the way, the 6 billion was born two days ago. Have you heard about that on the radio? 6.00000 billion people now on Earth. Uh, is about four times 10 to the 20 joules per year. That is the entire consumption. The United States has only one thirtieth of the world population and consumes one fifth of that. We are really energy spoilers, big energy spoilers. The sun is a wonderful source of energy. The sun has a power of four times 10 to the 26 watts. Four times 10 to the 26 joules per second. Mostly in the visible light and some in the infrared. If the sun is here and the earth is here, then you can calculate how much of that energy reaches the earth at the distance of the earth. So you have to know the distance, which we know that, that is 150 million kilometers. And so that energy goes out radially, symmetrically, isotropically in all directions. And so it's very easy, you know that the surface area of this sphere is 4 pi r squared, and so you can calculate how much for every square meter reaches the Earth. And that is a classic number that almost everyone knows, certainly people who are in solar energy, that is 1400 watts per square meter. That is what reaches the Earth. That is about 100 million joules per square meter every day. It would be nice if we could harvest that. And it would be nice if we could use that 100 million joules per square meter per day to provide the world with this 4 times 10 to the 20 joules per year. To do that, you would need 10 to the 10 square meters to absorb that solar energy. That's trivial. That's only the size of Holland. No big deal. If we lose Holland, that's no big deal. <laughs> so, however, there is a catch. There is day and night, which we haven't allowed for yet. We just assumed that the sun was always there. There are clouds. And then the sun rises and the sun sets. And of course, if the sun is at the horizon, and here is your plane where you try to absorb the sun, you get nothing. So you have the cosine of the angle has to be taken into account. And then the efficiency of the units that you're using with which you capture the solar energy could be, could be solar cells. It's a very low efficiency. And if you take all that into account, you would need an area more like 400 by 400 miles. Now you're really talking. That's something like whole of England and the whole of France. And so not only are the costs staggering, but it is simply beyond our present technological capabilities. So solar energy plays a very small role in our world economy. Nuclear energy, which is the fission of uranium or plutonium, was very popular in the 70s, but it has become a little bit less popular lately. We had the Three Mile Island accident in our own country, and you've heard just a few weeks ago about the nasty accident that there was in Japan. So people are, understandably so, emotionally strongly biased against the use of nuclear energy. But nuclear energy is all around me, at least every day. I uh, have a very special collection of Fiesta ware, which is American tableware, which was designed and been built in the 30s, in 1937, and it went on until the 50s. And here I brought you some of this. This is a 10-inch plate, and this is called Fiesta Red. Even though it's orange, we still call it Fiesta Red. It has uranium oxide in it. That red is uranium oxide. That is the same uranium that powers nuclear reactors. This is cobalt. It has no uranium in it. And this, again, is my cup of tea. Radioactive uranium oxide. OK. You ready for this? You hear this? This is a Geiger tube. It can measure the gamma rays that the uranium emits when it spontaneously breaks up in pieces and energy is released. We call that fission. You hear a little beep. I'll hold it close to my microphone. That's the point.
plates from which I eat. This cup has no uranium oxide. But my cup of tea radioactive. So if you want to come for dinner, you're more than welcome to do so. But you know what you're in for. We have fossil fuel on Earth. We are consuming, at this moment, the fossil fuel at a rate which is a million times faster than nature could create it. One million times faster. And if we consume it at the present rate, or increase, maybe by only 3% per year, then we won't have any left in less than 100 years. So we have an energy crisis, a real energy crisis. And we have an environmental problem, because all these power plants and all the industries cause pollution. And so, what are we going to do about it? My own energy consumption is quite modest, I think, although I'm also in your country, so I'm sure I also consume six times more than the average person in the world. I use electricity, for which I get a bill. I have gas, heat, I heat with gas, and I have also cooking with gas. I use my car, gasoline, and when I add that all up, I think I consume roughly 400 million joules per day. That 400 million joules per day is the equivalent of having 100 slaves working for me like dogs 12 hours a day. Think about that. What a luxury, what an incredible time we live in. 100 slaves are working for every single person here in my audience. 12 hours a day working like dogs to make you live comfortably. For one kilowatt hour of electricity, which is uh, four million joules, I pay only a lousy 10 cents. My entire energy bill for those 100 slaves is no more than $150 a month. What a bargain to have 100 slaves working for you for $150 a month. But now comes the $64 million question. How are we going to continue this? Because we are running out of fossil fuel and nuclear energy has its problems. Well, the only way that we might survive, the quality of life is at stake here, is nuclear fusion, not fission, whereby uranium and plutonium breaks up in pieces, but fusion. If you could merge deuterium with deuterium, you gain energy. Now we have one out of every 6,000 hydrogen atom on Earth is deuterium. And we have a billion cubic kilometers of water now, it is unclear whether we will ever succeed in making a fusion reactor working. That is still completely unclear. People work hard on it. But if we succeeded, then simply the oceans would provide the world, if we consume it, at that same rate that we are consuming today, 4 times 10 to the 20 joules per year, we would have enough energy for 25 billion years. All the worries are over. Because the Earth is not going to survive for any more than 5 billion years, Five billion years from now, the sun will become 100 times bigger than it is now, and it will just swallow up the world, and it will be the end of MIT, of everything. So, all we have to think of is in terms of energy for about five billion years. I want to leave you with what I call a brain teaser. I have here a very special ball. And... I'm going to bounce this ball, and I want you to look at it and tell me what you think is the source of that energy. It's important that we have little light, because if there's too much light, then you won't see it well. So this is a, a ball. So you have another one here. And I will bounce it here. And then notice what you see. Just keep looking. It stops. The other one.
and the other one. Now, I want you to think about, you've seen now what happens. I bounce it, it starts blinking. Clearly, there's MGH available when I bounce it. Where does the energy come from of the blinking light? Think carefully before you give an answer. It took my graduate students and me un embarrassingly at least 10 minutes before we had the answer. Think about the fact that they continue to blink and then stop. Talk about it among yourselves. Think about it when you have dinner, breakfast, when you take your shower. And discuss it on Pivot. See you next Friday.